Hi and welcome to Physics High and today I'm going to go through the answers of the short answer section of the 2022 HSC Physics paper. But before we start, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell to get my latest updates. And please consider supporting my work by buying me a coffee. The link is in the description below. So let's get started. Now, this question 31 is our nine mark question. Now, this nine mark question gives you a real good opportunity to demonstrate a comprehensive understanding of the concepts presented here. So being nine marks always encourage you. That does not mean you spend a significant amount of time, like 15 minutes writing. Nine marks basically means approximately 14, 15 minutes of time to do that question. But you would put aside a portion of that in terms of your planning. The question here is about the Rutherford model first, about the Geiger-Marsden experiment, and then therefore Rutherford proposed a particular model. Then Bohr modified that model to explain the spectra that is represented here, in this case of hydrogen. And so the question says, how do the features of this model account for all the experiment evidence that is above here? and then to support your answers with a calculation. So obviously I'm not using this whole space to make a full written response here. So I'm gonna to touch on the key aspects that you need to talk about. The first of all is understand, what you need to identify what the model that is going to be represented here. Number one, when we're looking at Rutherford, you need to mention the fact that what we have is a planetary model. That is, it's a model where we have a single nucleus with electrons in orbit. You need to state that the model prior to that was J.J. Thomson's plum pudding model, which basically was a diffuse sphere of positive charge with electrons embedded in it, called the plum pudding model. And what the geiger marsden experiment was, was fire alpha particles here towards gold foil. And what was discovered is that the vast majority passed straight through, which is what we have here. You need to mention this. And then a very, very few actually not only deflected, but bounced back. In fact, Rutherford was so sh shocked by the results that he likened it to a cannonball bouncing off a piece of tissue paper. Now, what that means was that he then predicted that the atom was, most of its mass was centered in the nucleus in about one ten trillionth of the volume of the atom. And so therefore we have a compact nucleus with electrons in orbit around them. And that explained the fact that we had the vast majority passing through. They would basically just pass straight through. And occasionally alpha particle would then, due to Coulomb repulsion, would bounce back in the opposite direction, but very rarely. And so we've got the model. We've explained why that model developed from the J.J. Thompson model and tied in the experimental evidence. Now, the next step is to talk about Bohr. Now, when we're dealing with Bohr, Bohr had a problem with this model. In fact, there was a big limitation of this model, is that these electrons are rotating in an orbit, which means their velocity is changing, which means they're accelerating, which by Maxwell's equations, those electrons should be emitting electromagnetic radiation and therefore should lose energy and spiral in, and they don't. So as a result, Bohr modified the model in terms of having a central nucleus but now what we have is electrons in discrete orbits. And now those discrete orbits, in essence, means there was no energy gain or loss as long as they stay in the orbit. However, in seeking to understand also this spectral analysis here, it was Bohr who understood that if you have a certain amount of energy that you put into the electron, it could jump to the new energy level, a very specific amount of energy, by the way. And so if this was uh, energy level one and this was energy level two, then what he sought to show was that the amount of energy at level one, uh, energy level two, basically needed an energy of E equals HF. And that, of course, is the famous Planck's equation. And that means if the electron jumped one energy level down, then that 
would result in the emission of very specific amounts of energy and again of specific amount of frequency as a result. Now this spectral graph here was actually described mathematically by both Barmer and Rydberg and we now have the Rydberg equation for this and the Rydberg equation says that the what we call the wave number, which is the inverse of the wavelength, is equal to the Rydberg constant multiplied by 1 over nf squared minus 1 over ni squared. That is, these were whole discrete numbers. And this is where Bohr stepped in and he said, actually, if this nf and ni are your energy levels, then we can actually work out the exact energy we have from this mathematical relationship. And so in the case of the lines I've got here, we've got hydrogen spectrum. We have the hydrogen spectrum where the NF, the final, is actually two. So in other words, Bohr said, well, for the series here that we have here, which are the Barmer series, this NF is the final one for two. So what we end up getting is one over the wavelength is equal to Rydberg constant multiplied by one over two squared. Now this means Obviously, we could have a three or a four where they're jumping down to either from the three down to two or from the four down to two. Now, what we'll do is we'll do, let's say, the four down to two. We're going to see what energy we get. So we'll drop down from four to two. And the initial was four. So we put one over four squared there. And so now what we do is we calculate this value. Now, the right big constant is 1.097 by 10 to the power of seven. Then we multiply this by one over four minus one over 16. When you work that out, you get the wave number is equal to 2056875. What we're saying here is, is simply we have 2,056,875 wavelengths in one meter. We can now work out the wavelength by just writing the inverse of that and we get 4.86 by 10 to the power of negative 7. That is 486 nanometers. Now, if we look over here, we have this line right here, which is our 486 nanometers. We have an answer here that is consistent with the hydrogen spectrum that we have over here. That supports the Rutherford Bohr atom. Now in this question, we're dealing with initially with module six, where we're dealing with electromagnetic induction and specifically Lenz's law. And I'll explain that in a moment. And the second part deals with torque, which can be found in module five. Now, let me explain. What we have here is an exercise bike and we have a wheel that is spinning and we have a magnet here that somehow causes a resistive force on this aluminium fly disc. And then so we've got to provide the torque to make it harder to pedal. And we need to understand why does a magnet do that? Well, first of all, the fact that it's aluminium does not mean it's attractive just simply because it's a metal. Aluminium is conductive, but it's not ferromagnetic. That is, it does not respond to stationary magnets. And so in the case here, it needs to be spinning for us to have that effect. Now to help us understand what's going on here, I'm just gonna draw a large version version of our flywheel and I'm going to have this as our axis where the magnet sits and I'm going to place our magnet right there and we're going to make our flywheel turn in that direction. What's going on? Well, we don't know the polarity or the direction of the magnetic field, whether it's going in that way or coming out that way. And it really doesn't matter for us. What we need to do is to explain why these magnets cause a resistive force to be applied. And the key here is the concept of the fact that above here and below here, the metal is moving in this case away from the magnet. And here that metal is approaching towards the magnet. It also therefore means we have a change of flux or a rate of change of flux that's going on and an EMF of course is equal to negative phi delta phi over t. We have a rate of change of flux. Now if we have a chain, an EMF we're going to produce a current if the circuit is closed and it's in fact exactly what happens. We get a series of eddy currents. We get an eddy current that occurs ahead of it and an eddy current that occurs behind it.
But Lenz's law, which is the negative symbol, suggests that the polarity of these eddy currents will be such that it opposes the motion. Now, in this case, if we have our metal here moving away, we have um, eddy current here that will oppose that. So we need some sort of attraction here. So in other words, if we have on this side, let's say a North Pole here, then what happens is this eddy current will have a South Pole on this side. And as a result, that eddy current will be an attractive one. It opposes the fact that it's moving away. Similarly speaking here though, what we have is our North on this side, but what we now get is an eddy current that has a polarity of the North here. Now what that means is that now it repulses there. So in other words, it's moving towards the magnet, but this eddy current will provide some resistance. Both of those combined will provide the force that as a result, you need to provide effort to keep this turning. It would eventually cause this to slow down if you did not continue to pedal. Now, if you continue to apply a pedal to it, you're doing work on this system. You're putting energy into the system. And that energy, of course, is now converted into electrical energy by the way of the eddy currents. And that is consistent with the conservation of energy, which is an important key aspect of understanding Lenz's law. Now, the direction of these eddy currents will be opposite to each other. Again, and I've labeled this as south and north. So the direction will be basically opposite to each other relative to what's happening over here. And again, that all depends on what the polarity here is of our ma uh, magnet in the center. Now, that solves part A. Now the biker says, well, I want to increase the force. What could they do to modify this to increase the force? And to do that, what they need to do is move the magnet across the flywheel to the new position, which is going to be here we need to justify why that actually increases the force. And there's two reasons. The first is, is we have now increased our radius significantly. The torque is equal to the force that's applied multiplied by the radius. Now, in this case, the force is perpendicular. So I've left off the sine theta here for this formula. So by increasing the radius, we're increasing the torque and automatically increasing the torque means more effort. But that's not the only thing that results in an increased force. If they move the magnet over here, the velocity, although the angular velocity is constant, the linear velocity here is equal to r omega, but the linear velocity here is equal to r dash omega. So in other words, this increased radius means an increase in linear velocity. An increased linear velocity means an increased rate of change of EMF, which automatically means we have an increasing strength of eddy currents, and as a result, that increases as well. So our torque significantly becomes bigger because we are increasing not only the radius, which is this one right there, we're also increasing the force that we're getting due to the electromagnetic induction. So by both accounts, as a result, we're getting an increase in the effort for the bike cyclist as they move the magnet across. Now in this question, we're dealing actually with two components of module five, which deals in this case with circular motion. And then we also have a section here to deal with projectile motion. And so what we have here is a hammer thrower spinning a mass around and they're spinning a seven kilogram mass at a radius of 1.6 meters. And it has a period of 0.5 seconds. And the first question we're asked is, what is the vertical component of the velocity at P here? So in other words, at, when it flies off here at an angle of 45 degrees. So we only want that initial vertical velocity, but we're asked, we're actually told the value that it is 14.2. We need to show that it is equal to 14.2. So to do that, we need to work out what the velocity is in the first place. Well, because it's in a circular motion, and we'll do this first, we know that the velocity of something that is going around a circle is simply equal to 2 pi r over t. Now we're given the values that we need. So we've got 2 multiplied by pi, our radius is 1.6 meters, and then divide that by the period of 0 0.5. Now that gives us an answer of 20.1 meters per second. Now the 
component we need here now is the, and of course this is going to be also our initial velocity when it's let go, so I'm going to call it u now, and it's y. We multiply our 20.1 by the sine of 45, and when you get that, you'll get 14.2 meters per second, which shows us the value that we need in the first place, and so that solves that particular part. The beauty about this, of course, like all previous questions where we've had this show type of question, is that if you struggle in part A, you can still do part B because you're actually given the initial velocity vertically for the projectile section. Now let's do that part for part B. And before we go, we need to draw a quick diagram over here. So here is our line over here. This is going under projectile motion like this. Why have I started up here? Because we're told that it actually leaves at 1.2 meters above the ground. So this already is 1.2 meters here. And now what we do is set out our variables. And I always encourage that you look at the y direction and at the x direction, and you do SUVAT and SV to SUT on the other side. And so our displacement is negative 1.6. Why is it negative 1.6? Because it starts up here and moves down, and we're making down a negative direction. Our initial velocity, of course, is the value we've already worked out, and that's 14.2. And I'm just leaving the units off here just for the sake of clarity. Our final velocity isn't given. Our acceleration is equal to negative 9.8, and our time is there. Now S, of course, that's the one we're looking for. That's the range we're after. Our initial velocity horizontally ends up actually still also being equal to 14.2, and our final time is unknown. And it's these two times that are exactly the same. The time it takes to go up and down is the same as the time it takes to move across. So how do we solve this? Well, let's quickly look at what we might get if we were to just look at S, U, A, and T. Well, the equation we would use is S is equal to U, T plus a half A, T squared. So what you end up getting is negative 1.6 is equal to 14.2 multiplied by T plus A is negative 9.8, so I might as well write negative 4.9, and then T squared. Now you can see in a lot of projectile motion problems where you use that equation, you'll see a zero ends up being here because the initial velocity is zero, and so it becomes easy to solve for T, which you need for part B, or part over here. However, you see you won't have that, and you have here a quadratic formula that you could use. Now, I'm going to write this really quickly up here. For those who do mathematics standard, normal mathematics, for those who do mathematics, the, 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 you'll see this formula, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And you can use that to solve t. So what if, for example, you're not familiar with that particular mathematical formula? Is there a other way to do that? And yes, there is. And that is, well, let's work out the final velocity vertically. And that way we can actually work out the time independent of this. So if we write v squared equals to u squared plus 2as, you can see we have all of those values. So u is 14.2 all squared plus 2 multiplied by negative 9.8 multiplied by s. Now remember our s is going to be our negative 1.2. And so you end up getting a v squared of equal to 225.2. So our v ends up being very close to 15 meters per second. Now we've got v, we can now work out t. So v is equal to u plus a t. We have our 15. Now remember this is 15 downwards, so this becomes negative 15 is equal to positive 14.2 plus negative 9.8 multiplied by, our t ends up being here equal to 2.98 seconds. Now we know this is 2.98 seconds. We can now work out the range. Our s is equal to 14.2 multiplied by our 2.98 and we get a range of 42.3 meters. And there's your answer.
Now in this question, we're dealing with charges moving through a magnetic field, which is part of the topic of module six, electromagnetism. We have three charges, two of them, X and Y are moving upwards and Z is moving downwards. And we're told that they all enter at the same speed and we're asked to explain the curves that we have here. We're gonna obviously from your perspective, so basically the, char the magnetic field are crosses, so they're actually coming in this way. So first of all, let's talk about X, Y, and Z, and we'll put X over here and Y over here and Z over here. And let's describe how they behave and let's see how we can explain why they go that way. First of all, they're all moving at the same velocity. And the mathematical formula that combines everything that we have is that the fact is that they're going under a circular path is that we end up having MV squared over R equals to QVB. Now, because they all enter with the same velocity, we're gonna rearrange this. And so what we end up getting is that the velocity that we have is equal to Q multiplied by B multiplied by R over m and so the fact is all have the same velocity this value has to be constant for all three charged particles first of all let's have a look at the direction you can see that for x and y they're curving up now using my right hand that means magnetic field wise are they going in that way and the charges are going towards that direction here they're being forced upwards now my thumb represents the direction of conventional current so basically x and y are positively charged so we could say this is positive and this is positive but because this one is bending downwards we know this is a negative charge okay and we're using how do we understand that by using the right hand uh, rule or right hand palm rule all right rhs and that's consistent for all of those three here we've explained how we've determined the charges now what we all to note is also the fact is that they have different radii now you can see that the radius for x is approximately that value here the radius for y is something like that value and the radius for z is, all, is basically something about that value. You can see that if we talk about the radius, then the radius for this one is the largest. So let's call this radius X, radius Y, and radius Z. Then what we can straight away say that in terms of the radius, the radius is largest for Y. So this has the largest R. This one has the smallest R. And this one has, let's say, the mid. Uh, but now let's explain why those radii are different. If we look at the mathematics here, we can see there are two aspects we need to look at. Now to understand what's going on here, we can see that basically it could be the charge or it could be the mass that determines the path that we have here. So in other words, for example, if we have a large radius, we need to have a smaller charge. We could also have a larger radius due to the fact that therefore we need a larger mass, but we don't know which one we have. But what we can do is isolate this component right here, which is the charge to mass ratio. So let's refer to that charge to mass ratio. And so the fact that the radius is largest for Y, that means it has to have a smaller charge to mass ratio. Now, if you look at the curvatures here, RZ has the smallest rate has the smallest radius. If that is the smallest, this one has the largest charge to mass ratio. In terms of RY, that's the largest radius. That means that ratio must be the smallest. So it has the smallest charge to mass ratio of the three, whereas X has got to be sort of in the middle. So although we don't know the charge, and although we know we know the mass, we do know that the combination of those, a charge to mass ratio, we can discuss. And that explains why the paths are the way they are. So now we come to the last question of this particular HSC paper. And in this question, we're dealing again with module five, in this case, the concept of gravitation, which is the third inquiry question. And what we here have is a scenario where we have a capsule that is orbiting the International Space Station. We're provided the radius of the rotation that this capsule is moving. And we're also provided the velocity at which the capsule is going and the masses of the respective International Space Station and the capsule. And we're given 
a statement that we're meant to analyze. And we basically asked, basically, we've got uniform circular motion of the capsule can be explained or at least accounted for by the understanding the principles of gravitation between these two spacecraft. So the way to solve this is to say, okay, let's work out the gravitational force first between the two and then ask, well, if it's going in an orbit, then the centripetal force is actually provided for by that gravitational force. And so we can work out those two independently. So let's start off first by saying our gravitational force. Our gravitational force is equal to G M M over R squared. Our large M is our International Space Station, the lower M is our capsule, and R of course is the radius between the two. So I'm going to substitute our values in, and we get a value of 8.4 by 10 to the power of negative 4 newtons. That's not a lot of force indeed. Now let's have a look at the terms of circular motion and ask ourselves, well, what does the centripetal force between the two, assuming that it is actually staying in orbit? So we go Fc is equal to mv squared over r, and the mass here is the mass of our capsule, and we get a value of 2.36 newtons. Let's see what this means. This is saying that the gravitational force between the capsule and the International Space Station is actually that value. This is saying that if this is true, if it stays in this orbit, then the centripetal force that is required for that capsule to stay in that circular path must be 2.36 newtons. In other words, in our analysis of this hypothesis, it's incorrect. There is no way possible that the gravitational force can actually account for this particular value. Now, there is another way we can examine this as well, and that is actually combining the two and ask ourselves the question, if the gravitational force is actually being able to determine the centripetal force, can we then work out what the velocity of the capsule will be if that is true. In other words, we're going through this problem, we're looking at this problem at a slightly different angle. And so what we start by saying is here, is that our Fg is equal to our Fc. What we're saying here is, is our, our G M M over R squared is equal to MV squared over R. Now, if I rearrange that, I what I get is the concept of the orbital velocity, which simply says that the velocity if an object is undergoing circular motion due to gravitation, is simply equal to the gravitational constant multiplied by the mass of the central body, which is our International Space Station, mind you, divided by the radius. Now, if I substitute all those values in, and I'll get, and then the final answer becomes, so what am I saying here is that if this is true, and again we're using the concept of gravitation here and centripetal motion, then the velocity of the capsule in order to stay in orbit in this situation has to be 3.4 by 10 to the negative 4 meters, meters per second. If we drill that down, that basically means 0.34 millimeters per second the velocity it needs to be to have this orbit. Now, the velocity provided here is significantly larger. It's over 622 times larger. Again, we're showing that this statement is incorrect. In order to get there for the maxima marks, you need to talk about the law of gravitation and then use the mathematical analysis in terms of centripetal motion as well as gravitation to show that this statement is actually false. This hypothesis is incorrect and you actually need to explicitly say that. And that summarizes the answers for the short answer for the HSC. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Put a comment down below if this has been helpful for you. And please consider supporting my channel by buying me a coffee. The link is in the description below. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care and bye for now.